level. So we talked about the first level of, uh, of nested virtualization. And now we'll talk about the, the second level of nested virtualization. We call it, uh, uh, more fondly, we call it inception. Um, it's basically nested square, so where you run uh, yet another hypervisor on top of HVX. And uh, we think this is interesting, very interesting, uh, for a variety of different use cases that are completely untouched in the industry right now, we think, uh, from, a, from a public cloud perspective. Um, so what Gil talked about in the last session was what you see on the left of this diagram. So you have AWS or Google, basically a bunch of x86 servers with Zen or KVM in the case of Google, Zen in the case of Amazon. That's what you have here. We run HVX on top, the binary translation with direct execution, a lot of optimizations and stuff that Gil talked about. That is running on top of, of Amazon. And then you run your VMware or KVM VMs on top of that. That's what we spoke about so far. That is nested virtualization because actually Amazon has a hypervisor. We are running HVX, which is another hypervisor on top of that. That's nested virtualization. Now, we also got a lot of requests. Actually, uh, the, the story around this really started with Red Hat, who's a customer of ours, and they were using us, and they said, look, it would be, you know, we're doing a lot of work with OpenStack. It would be really cool if we could run OpenStack training and demo environments and stuff in the public cloud, because that way, when we have, you know, 100 students for a class, we can spin up 100 environments, and if the next day there are 200 students, we can accommodate that demand. So we're training a lot more people faster. There's no backlog. It's much better, better training. Everybody has their own environments. But the problem with that was that we needed to run KVM in the cloud. If you've ever run, you, you can technically run OpenStack with <coughs> QMU instead of KVM, but it's, it's, it's pretty slow and quite, uh, from a usability perspective, not quite pleasant because everything is just so sluggish. Uh, it's emulation, basically. So what we, uh, they came to us and said, hey, can you, since you've got this layer and you've got this sort of hypervisor in the middle, can you do something to, to help us here? So we started thinking about it, and Gil's team came up with uh, this basic notion of inception. That's what we call here. The, the concept here is if you, if you think why you can't run ESXi on Amazon today, it's because, essentially, that and what Amazon gives you is a virtual machine. In that virtual machine, you cannot see the Intel VT instruction sets that are running in the x86 hardware below that. Okay, So what if we could just take that Intel VT or AMD V, it's called SVM, um, instruction set and implement that in HVX? and call that a different platform type. So you have a platform type which exposes VMware devices. We showed you that. You have a platform type that exposes KVM devices. So you can run KVM virtual machines. We showed you that. What if we come up with a third platform type and actually expose that as x86 hardware and with, with, with Intel VT functionality uh, conceptually? That is what we call inception. So now when we have a virtual machine that's sitting on top of HVX, we actually, it actually sees Intel VT or AMD V functionality, and now we can run a hypervisor on top of that, everything from KVM to ESXi. But that's what we've done so far. Okay? It, it mm -hmm. sees it because you're passing it through, or you're doing some kind of an emulation? How does it see it? Uh, Gil, you want to talk a little bit about the exact mechanics of that? Yeah, so it's more, in the, it's more like emulation. There's nothing to pass through because it's not exposed to HVX itself. AWS but and Google hide the actual hardware. Yeah, but although one at first would say, hey, you're emulating it, so things are going to run extremely slow, actually the, thing, the way that we've implemented it, and I can't go into all the details first of all, because it would take us two days or so, and you guys are probably a bit tired, um, but also because it's a bit complex, but we basically, the overhead is almost identical to as if it was running directly on HVX. We have a, a nice... Uh, yeah. Patent on that. Yeah. And it's actually, it's actually very interesting because if when you're running a guest on HVX natively and you're to, there's one context switch and then you're running directly on the CPU, uh, it, 
and then when you're running with a guest on top of, let's say, ESXi on HVX, there's one additional context switch, and then you're running directly on the CPU as well. So as a result, it depends on how long the instructions are executing. The overhead could actually be very little, mm -hmm. especially if that context switch is a very small portion of the time relative to the time the instructions have to run. Yeah. So it's basically that, and it's a, it's a very interesting thing. We have, uh, you know, I think several patents on that coming up, and... Uh, uh, we're excited about this. So this is the core capability that really allows you to run uh, ESXi or KVM, but conceptually any hypervisor on top of the public cloud now on top of Revelo, basically. Mm -hmm. So Gil, why don't you uh, log in sure and uh, go ahead and look at a demo, do show do a demo of the, the ESXi, ESXi setup. Right? Yeah, sure. So what I have... Okay. So, what I'm going to show you is that I have here in my library, Shruti showed you earlier, I have here a blueprint. And in this blueprint, we basically have 11 VMs. Eight of those are ESXi hosts. I have an NFS server for networking, uh, for storage. I have a Windows client, if you want to use the, the client uh, uh, version of the vSphere uh, Who would want to use the Windows client? So I would like to use that. <laughs> and I have a vCenter appliance basically running here. So this is a reusable um, blueprint. It was created by... It's really... It's really fuzzy, but uh, right? Um, anyway, um, the focus is all right. It's not yeah, so bad. it's all right. That's okay. Okay, so we've installed everything here from, from ISOs. You can also use cool stuff like what Alistair is doing, you know, to create such, a, such environments. So basically, what I did earlier, I actually did it from my phone on the Uber on the way here, was just to, to click on create application and publish it. So I already have it up and running. So let me just quickly go here. So we have here templates. this application up and running right now on Amazon. You can see that it has these 11 VMs all are green. Just to be clear, these 11 VMs are all running on HVX. Yeah. It's not, you don't have a, a Windows appliance running on top of one of those ESXi hosts. We've not got there yet. We do. But, we do, uh, but um, you don't see it here. Uh, <laughs> we'll get to it. Okay. And um, so what you have here is 11 VMs. They're running most likely on two, uh, two HVXs. Actually, give one second. That's a really good question because yeah. what you see on the canvas are, are just things that are running on oh, yeah. HVX. Yeah. yeah. One of those things that happens to be running on, actually eight of those things that happen to be running on HVX in this case are ESXi nodes, and they have VMs running in them. You don't see that in the Revelo canvas. They're inside ESX. So for... See? We have to map, move one floor up. Yeah. You walk into the data center and all you see is the bunch of HP servers that are racked there. You don't see what's running inside. It's right, but here there's 11 machines on the canvas, right? Yeah. 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 So those 11 machines are running on HVX, not on ESX. Correct. Correct. But eight of them of are ESX servers. But eight, right. Yeah, but eight of those are ESX servers. So right now, though, there's nothing running on top of the ESX IOs. We are all there in are, but the we, we haven't, we haven't yeah. shown you that. We haven't yet. shown you that. We're going to use vCenter to, <laughs> to log <laughs> in. Right. To go to the dream within the dream. Right. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to, uh, can can you wake up and die. As part of the blueprint, can you uh, tell it that there's an order to start up? Yes. Yes. Well, definitely. Great question. Very good question. We can show you that. So I think it's actually not configured, but oh, for each blueprint you can. You have a start order, and you can create stages it. with. Yeah. 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 Um, so, by the way, something that we haven't shown earlier, something which is cool. It's unrelated specifically to A6, but because we basically have control over the underlying hardware, we also expose the hardware console to everything that we're up and running here. Yeah. So for by example, the way, that's not something that you can do very easily in the cloud. No. Uh, but with Revelo, so you can. Yeah, it's, you can it's a web-based console, so you can now really see that this is ESXi running. Um, and if I just click on the vCenter here, so you can see that we've created quite a bit of different uh, external services. For example, we've exposed the 9443 uh, web UI of the vCenter. And this is basically our uh, uh, FQDN for this VM on 9443. I just logged in before. And we can see that this is a fully functioning vCenter environment with, as I said, eight hosts, ATSXI hosts, basically running here. 
and I also started a few virtual machines uh, earlier today. Yeah, just a couple. So I can... is that DNS? Is the fully qualified DNS name automatically generated by you guys? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's a, we get the public okay. IP, we show you that, and we also generate a FQDN for you, Very which good. you can use to log in. Notice that the FQDN is slightly obscured as well, so you can't yeah. sort of jump yeah. into somebody else's environment yes, easily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and this is the console for an Ubuntu guest running on top of ASXi, running on top of HVX, running on, top on of Amazon, <laughs> running on top of Zen, <laughs> running on top of a server yeah. uh, on Amazon. And the cool thing here is that you can basically do anything that you would do normally in your VMware setup in your data center. So for example, one of the cool things that, that we did was, for example, to create a complex vSAN setup. And so I'll just go ahead and, for example, this one, and it's a, pretty large one. This is a 32-node vSAN setup, which I have a repeatable way to actually create in the public cloud. So I just hit the Create Application and then Publish button, and I have this entire cluster up and running in a few minutes without needing to provision disks or servers in my own data center. So we believe this is quite powerful uh, concept. Yeah, a little bit. And uh, Shruti, you want to talk a little bit about the use cases that we see for this particular uh, nested square or inception use case, specifically in the ESXi arena, that would be great. Yeah, it's, um, it's been really interesting. Um, you know, personally, I worked at VMware uh, earlier and you know, feel very close to the community. So looking at this and thinking about what are the possibilities, Right. If you could have your own ESXi lab um, and it was on demand and you didn't have to wait for hardware, what are the possibilities it could open up? So if you think about technology partners, right, a lot of TAP partners are doing dev test with ESXi. So think about Veeam that might need a bunch of ESXi um, clusters to go test out different releases. Right. Um, think about sales demos and trainings. Each time uh, they need, you know, maybe like Naveen mentioned, 100 students in the class, you need multi-node ESXi deployments for each of those 100 students. It gets pretty complicated, right? Uh, if you had a lab like this, would it make adoption easier for people? POCs and evaluations is another interesting one. Uh, I think some of you do work with um, consulting firms, and we've heard um, very often that when you go into a customer environment, one of the things that always stalls a POC is waiting for the customer to get the hardware so they can set up the POC. What if you could have something that you know, you're, um, you've already got up and running in the public cloud? You can hand that over to the customer to play with. It's an isolated sandbox. While the customer goes and gets the hardware, you've already got something to get started with. right? So. We don't see this as a replacement for hardware. Let's get real, right? You need to have your hardware to run your ESXi for your production deployments. But there are a lot of other things that you can do, mainly around dev tests, demos, trainings, POCs. When it comes to uh, enterprise customers, you can also think about them using it for upgrade testing, right? vSphere 6 just came out. You have your vSphere 5.5 deployment. You want to basically, somebody, one of the customers used the word double tank, right? You want to recreate the whole uh, thing so that you see what happens when you upgrade to vSphere 6. Where do you have that much hardware sitting around to recreate that um, you know, upgrade testing lab? You could do that here, see what works, and then go ahead and uh, push that same process to production. So these are some of the different use cases we've been thinking about. We'd love to hear from you if you have um, other thoughts and ideas. You know, we're really trying to figure out. Uh, right now, we're in uh, beta period for the ESXi. Um, we already talked about the pricing, so I won't go into this too much. But I also wanted to point out, um, you know, we feel really fortunate uh, to have received some good uh, support from the VMware community, right? Um, while we're working on HVX, uh, we're looking at uh, 
various ways to optimize things. But really, the VMware community has the kind of expertise in ESXi that we don't have, right? So to be able to go to the VMware community and say, here's your lab, what do you want to do with it, uh, has been a lot of fun. And um, I want to call out some of the really cool ones uh, that you know we've been super excited about. Scott Lowe helped us and advised us on designing a 250-node uh, VMware data center. And um, you know, we kind of built some scripts around that that we're going to share. Where do you get to go play with a 250-node ESXi deployment, right? I personally had not gotten the chance to do this ever. Now I have a 250-node lab that I can spin up, um, play with it for a few hours, and throw it away. For 20 bucks. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really fun. Um, William Lamb's been a longtime supporter of nested virtualization in general. Even at uh, VMware, he's been uh, championing nested ESXi. So it was really cool that he went ahead and built a 64 node vSAN deployment. And um, you know, he also created some automation scripts to help folks. So you want your own vSAN lab to go play with something? Well, you can have it. Our very own Mike Preston here uh, built a very cool um, um, long distance V motion setup. So he had one uh, ESXi deployment on Amazon, another one on Google. And Mike, you want to tell us um, how your V motion experience was? It was good. It was good. Um, a lot of it was me trying to figure out how the, the new cross center uh, V motion stuff in VCR6 worked, but mm -hmm. it was a lot of fun. Right? Yeah, I so. broke it a lot of times and yeah. used the blueprint functionality uh -huh. for it. Yeah. I, I haven't seen anybody else do an AWS to Google you know, live migration. You might just be the first person on Earth to have done that. So. Right. <laughs> Very cool. Um, Alistair's uh, been kind enough to integrate uh, Autolab with Ruvalo, and we've been seeing a lot of activity around this. We just launched uh, something called the Ruvalo repo where people can share these blueprints, so you can have community blueprints that you know, anybody can go download. So Alistair's blueprint's there, and we've been seeing a lot of people going and downloading that blueprint, you know, which is great, because now they can go ahead and just um, deploy Autolab on Ruvelo. I think it's the number one uh, blueprint on repo. It's the most popular one, yep. yeah. yeah it's <laughs> number one, uh, number one uh, <laughs> blueprint on repo. Yeah, it's uh, winning the popularity contest there. Um, and Simon Gallagher uh, built something that he calls V Everything on Ravello. So he put every conceivable VMware product in there to build out a full VMware data center. And uh, that was you know, really interesting as well. So you know, we really appreciate all the feedback and the support. <coughs> and um, just last week, we announced a free lab service for all V experts. So this is our way of hopefully helping the VMware community. You know, we really um, want to support the innovation that the community is doing. So it basically gives all V experts a thousand free CPU hours for home lab use, it's for personal, non-commercial use, right? And um, I want to also extend that to everybody in this room. So for all the VFD5 delegates, Please um, feel free to go ahead and use um, the Ravello lab for your personal you know, home lab usage. So I hope that you will find that uh, helpful and interesting and that you will tell us what you did with your home lab. One interesting thing you can do is, uh, we were just chatting about this last night, if you already have three servers in your home lab, as I'm sure most of you probably do, uh, but if you have two to three sitting around, you can actually connect a VPN from that to your Ruvelo lab, so you have an extended lab in the cloud, and you can use it as a you know kind of expandable lab space uh, in case you need to run a few more VMs. So we um, you know, we feel lucky to be working with this community, and we really hope that um, you guys will make the most of that. And I want to hand it back to uh, Naveen and Gil to kind of talk about what else we're doing. But before that, any other questions, comments? Uh, well, we'd love to hear from you. I think you've just made my wife really happy with the 1,000 free hours a month. Because now she, yeah. 
basement. <laughs> we'll, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> the basement will be quiet again. Right. <laughs> I won't spend as much money. <laughs> and the electric bill will go down about $150 a month. <laughs> Cool. Okay, so, so let's uh, back, jump yeah. into some of what we're working on that you'll see in the in the very near future. So we're not talking about our, our long term roadmap or something. This is something that Gil's team is is already working on. Feel free to chime in, Gil. Mm -hmm. Right now, uh, one of the things to be aware of is that on HVX you can provision virtual machines that have a maximum of four vCPUs. Uh, so that's a, a the current sort of max limit that we've got right now. And we're working on extending that to actually eight and even 16 vCPUs. That's something that's looking very promising in mm -hmm. engineering. Yeah. Uh, we hope to be able to get it out soon. Uh, so that's the first one. We think that'll help because there are a lot of times when you need uh, VMs that have more than four vCPUs, especially now when s uh, some virtual appliances that come you know, ready-made that need more than four, uh, you have a bit of a challenge trying to get it to run with four vCPUs. So we're increasing that limit now. Uh, it should be available soon. And then the second one is around, we talked about this actually, uh, Luke, to your point, looking at exposing, you know, the, the first incarnation of, of the, the services we have right now is designed to be very easy to use, very simple to use, you know, things like that. But for power users such as yourselves, you want more control over the network, you want more control over the hypervisor, your placement options, scheduling, things like that. Uh, the first instantiation of that is on the network because there the pain is more acute. So we're working mm -hmm. on uh, enabling a lot more. You want to talk a little bit about the kind of things we're, we're thinking of coming up with this in this one? Yeah, so basically the way that right now people interact with their networking capabilities is by describing their, their VMs. And from that we automatically deduct the underlying network. And what we saw that in some cases Powers want to have direct control over the network, and that's exactly what we're going to do. So you'll actually be able to go to, we haven't covered it earlier, but as part of our network, we expose routing services, DHCP, DNS, a basic firewall, and we also have a distributed switch. So you will be able to go and configure each and one of those to the port level in the switch. Uh, so you'll be able to define, just as if you would be configuring your, your Cisco switch back in the, in the data center, or to add manual entries to the, to the DNS server, or to create reservations directly in the DHCP server, or to define uh, specifically uh, I don't know, two different routers which are not connected to each other, if that's what you actually want to, to build. So you'll have full control over your, your network in a single place. In fact, to build it as an intuitively as we can, but this is a very... As, and as quickly as we can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, so that's it. So those are the two major things that you'll see from uh, Ravello hopefully soon. And uh, I think that's the, uh, that's the end of what we have here right now. But we're happy to take any questions about either this or any of the other topics we've covered mm -hmm. so far. Go ahead, on, Luke. Uh, on the community effort, do you have any knowledge of somebody working on a vagrant implementation of your environment, setting up, deploying uh, based on a vagrant script? That's really interesting. Not that I know of at the okay, moment. Okay, fine to know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>